Excellent, perfect. So yeah, uh, thank you, Hannes. Uh, thanks so much for, for um, preparing the floor for this presentation. And just to give some context, this is, is a work we did um, started at, at ETH. Um, so several people who, who were involved with, with, with um, grid tools also involved with this project. And, and in fact, the, the, the kind of motivating slide that you see at the top is, is this with Matterhorn. Um, these are kind of um, in, not just inspiration, but really collaborations that, that happened with Meteor Swiss, um, CSCS and, and yeah, Wilker and Edinburgh. But um, it's a different, slightly different spin on, on, on the, the same um, challenge that, that Hannes uh, and, and the Swiss community are solving. And as a motivation, I, I like. I guess we had already a motivation, but let's get uh, very briefly into this motivation that there is this cosmo-atmospheric model, and in, in fact, many climate models um, that try to model both climate and weather. For example, this this cloud here at the top. And if we try to actually model this, um, we need to model our landscape in some kind of discrete fashion. And, and this is with a reasonably high resolution. Um, but if we actually go to more practical codes and um, you'll see that the, the lower the resolution is, the harder it will become to predict the um, snow um, at the cloud behind this mountain because eventually there's just no mountain very visible, right? And, and so, so these numbers are slightly up to date, not up to date, but, but roughly really um, the resolution for, for both weather and climate modeling is, is something that we would benefit a lot from increasing these resolutions. Um, and in particular, if we look at what happens behind these kind of computations, I mean, it's the same computational pattern that, that, that grid tools are solving. So we solve partial differential equations, um, finite differences over structured grids or later on unstructured grids, as, as Hannes also mentioned. Um, and the main computation here is this element-wise computation. So we look at a fixed neighborhood and we try to um, compute a new output value from, from some combination of these input or weighted combination of these input values. And that's what, what is really like one of the core computations in, in these models. And if we can make them run fast, um, we succeed. Um, the other computation, because it's not just the kind of classical, um, um, yeah, find a difference stencils, but sometimes there are these vertical dependencies, right? So we have along one dimension here on the horizontal, we have completely parallel um, stencils. And then in, in the vertical, we have loop carry dependencies um, that, that implement these called triagonal solvers. But these two concepts, triagonal systems and then plain stencils is basically the main computational pattern in these um, applications. And so weather modeling is interesting um, and, and helpful climate modeling is, is um, even more challenging. So, so we go um, today, we have kind of a resolution of one square kilometer. Um, we have 500,000, uh, 500 million square kilometers on the earth to cover and we want to kind of simulate for the next hundred years maybe. And so, so object, like we try to, to reach a time to solution of a couple of months and that is the kind of computational challenge. And then in addition, the, the community really uses mostly Fortran. It's like 300,000 lines of code and thousands of loops. So, so, so it's, it's a very large scale software project um, that needs to be accelerated to um, get reliable climate models. And, and just today's like CPU hardware, maybe even GPUs hardware is really insufficient in terms of memory bandwidth um, to accelerate um, these codes. And, but, but, and I think that is something that I think makes particularly interesting in this workshop or in general, if we talk with different people. So we have this computational challenge. Um, there's a lot of compute that needs to be executed. There's a software challenge. Um, there are complex software systems that need to be migrated and there's a hardware challenge to move um, to modern, highly um, specialized hardware. But, but the last challenge, and I think almost the most important one is a community challenge. So we have a large Fortran ecosystem. We have DSL and non-DSL code um, and HPC engineers want a lot of control over what they are doing. So trying to find a solution there that is really 
um, fits in well with the different communities and allows us to kind of work together and, and exploit synergies, I think is, is really um, key to for, for all of us to kind of contribute together um, to improve our kind of capabilities of doing climate modeling. And this is really, really just not just a couple of um, interested teams, but, but really like globally on a global scale that we can across countries and, 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 and institutions really work on, on, on addressing these issues. And so, yeah, there are many tools, GT Clang, grid tools is some of them. There are many other tools for stencils, but it, like the one observation really is that, that many, many research groups, many universities try to reason about stencils and, and, and have been very successful in their domain. Um, at the same time, um, there's a lot of redundant work happening in that space. And so obviously what, what <laughs> the typical solution for, for, for redundant, um, redundancies and communities is to, to come up with a standard which introduces yet another, yet another redundant solution. And so I'd like to pitch a little bit in this presentation um, my personal take on how we can potentially avoid some of these redundancies. And the key insight here really comes from the observation that many people here are potentially concerned about um, climate and, 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 and these kind of modeling issues transitively. But in practice, and, and, and that really points out the kind of like uh, the big advances uh, Major Swiss CSCS brought, only a single country, meanwhile, I think there are a couple more, uh, managed to run these climate codes on GPUs. And even GPUs are probably not fast enough to, to kind of get the, the computational bandwidth we really want. So the question is, how can we, despite having kind of a global um, global desire to solve these problems, how can we attract sufficient finance and then sufficient engineering resources to fundamentally um, advance this area? And our observation here really is that um, actually there is one field where, where people spend, invest uh, incredible amounts of money into building software um, that accelerates that domain. And this is just one example. So for example, Google with TensorFlow, but, but basically most um, tech companies today uh, spend billions on, 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 on software stacks for deep learning, and not just software stacks, even specialized hardware. And the question is, can we benefit in some way from, from these huge investments uh, and, and use them to, to, to accelerate our work in, in, in climate modeling, for example? And so, so to, to answer that question, I'd like us to take go way back and, and this introduces a technology that, that is meanwhile already two years old. But I think it's, it's quite important that, that we kind of get, like share this kind of key, key message that is around the technology. And the observation here was um, that compiler pipelines are actually today quite st standardized. So if you have a C++ compiler, 15 years ago, basically every company had their own C++ compiler. Um, today, with the exception of GCC, most C++ code is compiled through LVM and eventually targets on different hardware architectures. Um, in fact, that's not just true for LVM, uh, for C++, that's true for many programming languages, Swift, Rust, Julia, they all compile through LVM. So, so in terms of the programming language aspect, there's a large community um, of developers, both compiler developers and hardware backend engineers um, who work on, 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 on building a really stable product um, to make all these pro programming languages run. And interestingly, these programming languages do not just build up on LVM, but they introduce all their like domain specific or programming language specific abstractions um, that allows the programming languages both to target this highly diverse set of architectures, but also to perform like specialized optimizations transformations that allow these programming languages to be particularly competitive. And that's an interesting con op observation, right? So uh, many programming languages actually perform some kind of domain specific transformations. The same thing happens on deep learning. It's the same design, slightly different abstractions. TensorFlow is a, like a Python embedded DSL, which currently compiles through XLA and a couple of other um, compiler projects down to LVMIR. TensorFlow Lite didn't do that for a while, but meanwhile, that has changed. 
And climate modeling, as we've seen, compiles through, to, through stencil abstractions um, with different tools. Some use LVMIR directly, other tools um, in Fortran often may use LVM. Um, GT4Pi uh, now doesn't seem to use LVM. Uh, Glow is another like deep learning compiler which uses its own IR. But the main insight is there's often um, a lot of like even domain specific tools that, that eventually like use LVM as the way to, to obtain fast machine code. And just to give you kind of some context of, of how these things work, um, all these compilers have a very standard recipe of how they were designed. So you take a little bit of domain knowledge, you use that to build your custom intermediate representation. Uh, many of these IRs are actually inspired from, from LVM and they often even use LVM's data structures um, to, to implement their custom IRs. But they kind of manually implement many other topic, uh, the actual data structures are all manually implemented and, and then often they compile to LVM IR. So there's a lot of redundant work here, but the interesting thing is that there's already an implicit community movement towards kind of a, a standardization of the intermediate representations. And the question is, can we actually also avoid the, the redundant implementation work towards these um, reasonably similar IRs? And I just want for anyone who hasn't seen LBMIR, I'd like to give you a moment to, to, to look at the textual representation. Um, it has functions. It has function arguments. It has what's called a basic block. So it's a sequence of operations that's labeled and it has concept like a finite, um, which is kind of a way to, to merge um, variable names while preserving interesting static properties. And, and, and LVMIR basically has a pretty structured representation. And so if you would look at intermediate languages of other programming languages, for example, Swift, we'll see that the IR actually extremely different. So if we look at it, we can try to identify some items. There's a function call here, there's an argument. There are again lists of operations. So overall, these IRs are quite similar. And the question is, can we exploit these similarities to actually build larger communities? And what we observe is, Things that are different are typically the kind of types that are available, the operations that we see, or the different control flow constructs. But there are a lot, lot of lot more similarities. So they are units, functions, basic blocks, operations. All these are similar, and there's also some kind of control flow almost always. And so, the way the LVM community um, decided to exploit these properties is to really introduce an abstraction that enables sharing across communities. And this project is called MLIR, um, which really just standardizes on, on, on the general concept of an SSA-based intermediate re representation. It has a generic format for, for operations that can return results, uh, have a name, arguments, and, and a type. And we'll see here there's results, a name, arguments, and types. And below you see some examples. And that is maybe just a minor technical detail, but overall super exciting uh, because it allows us to share not just ideas, but really underlying infrastructure to build highly compatible um, abstractions within compilers. Um, so well, MLI also allows for blocks, a block name, list of instructions, terminator operations. All these concepts are available, but, but they can be instantiated over the particular set of instructions. Um, it allows for basic blocks, so just basic concept functions, function name, argument list, return types. And this, I think, is the most important thing. Um, it supports what's called dialects. So it allows us really to instantiate um, concepts, abstract um, domain specific concepts, um, and, and identify them through namespaces. So suddenly, like we can have a compiler that, that looks and behaves like LVM, but might be used for something entirely different. And this really allows us to change how we build a modern compiler IR. So instead of re-implementing most of the IR, we can now just define an MLIR dialect declaratively auto generate and reuse many of these components and eventually generate LVM IR. So in theory, now we can build a compiler that has a lot of the like robustness properties of LVM, 
um, but but for entirely different domains. And that's the idea. We could apply that to programming languages, but we can also apply that to TensorFlow, Glow, or for example, climate modeling. And in fact, this kind of ability to introduce multiple abstractions is quite interesting because we move away from this traditional compilation flow, um, which is quite one dimensional towards a flow where we can really like um, take advantage of abstractions that very different communities introduce. So for example, the MLI community started to introduce abstractions for loops, um, for linear algebra, and for many of these concepts, and even enabled Python-based DSLs um, from the deep learning communities to target these abstractions. And so the question is, can we maybe hook climate modeling as one of these users into that ecosystem? And that's why we brought up this Open Earth compiler. The general design is, is quite straightforward. Um, we have domain-specific languages like DeVito, GT4Py um, for climate weather modeling, seismic imaging. So, so, so there may be domain-specific languages. We don't touch that aspect. But in fact, we start at the shared intermediate representation um, that, that or start at the, the domain-specific abstraction that some of these um, languages share. And, and then we translate that um, abstraction, or in fact, we first optimize on this high-level abstraction and then translate it through loops and structure control flow eventually to GPU code. And this is a really standard flow, a flow that has been uh, implemented by Stella, by Grid Tools, by GT4Py. Uh, many of these tools implement such a flow, the same as, as DeVito uh, implements such a flow. It's, it's not particularly novel. However, what is novel, and I think that is really, really interesting to see, is that the actual domain-specific aspect of that project is incredibly small. So for our project, we only had like 3,000 lines of code. If you want to push that to a production quality implementation, you might need more. But the large amount of code here is either in different abstractions, so for loop, loop transformations, control flow transformations, arithmetic operations and, and GPU code generation, or it's in that vast majority uh, as part of this MLI LVM compiler infrastructure. So what you see here really is that, that actually doing domain-specific transformations requires a lot less engineering than initially thought. Um, the other interesting observation is that as part of this open world compiler, we actually developed a GPU backend and this GPU backend is already part of the LBM and MLIR community, so can be used by anyone else. Um, I go only quickly about the stencil dialect to make sure we leave a little bit of time for, for discussion. But the key idea is really um, that we have now domain-specific uh, operations, for example, a stencil apply um, that allows us to, to take a stencil operator here defined in the body of this apply, which has this bounded um, accesses and a couple of arithmetic operations. And the stencil apply allows us to, to apply the stencil over uh, what's called a stencil feed, so a multidimensional tensor. And the nice thing is, is as many um, dialects here, we, we have static offsets because they are stencils. And we can really, because it's a high level abstraction, um, perform domain specific rewrites here quite easily. Um, we do a couple of transformations. One is inlining, so we have two stencils in sequence, and we can translate that um, into a single more complicated stencil where the intermediate states are kept in registers. So that reduces register bandwidth. Um, we can also lower these transformations. So we can move away from the stencil operations actually to um, structure control flow which is, as I said, provided by the LVM infrastructure. Um, and after we have the structure control flow, we're basically in generic infrastructure, not domain specific, or actually highly domain specific, but shared by many domains. Um, so shared by many applications domains, but, but highly specific to, to, to the computational abstractions we care for. And that's basically where we introduced this GPU dialect. It's an abstraction for, for OpenCL CUDA, but um, represented at, at the compiler level. 
So it's overall idea is quite straightforward. We have a large translation unit, unit expressed in IR. Um, we can mark or uh, in, inline GPO launch calls um, that then will be eventually outlined into um, separate GPU modules, compiled into an um, PTX string, and then written, uh, executed through um, calls to CUDA or the AMD um, runtime libraries. And here's just a small example how we like this IR would look like. So we have a function that has a GPU kernel launch in line here. Eventually, this GPU kernel launch is outlined, and then we create a shared binary. Um, just a couple of numbers at the end of the presentation. Um, so we compare here on two weather models, Cosmo, a European model, and SV3, a US American model, on a couple of different kernels. Use a, at that point, quite recent NVIDIA GPU and compare here um, the memory bandwidth utilization first just with a roof line. So here we get a quite high bandwidth utilization of over eight, or close to 80%. And also actually a quite reasonable compute utilization. Um, so it doesn't look a lot, it's 10 to 20%, but, but for like climate codes, that's actually um, quite, quite good. We also compare here against tools like Red Tools, for example, and Dawn. Um, these are not the very latest numbers, but at that point, um, we, we outperform the, the existing um, tools, in part because the, 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 the version of Grid Tools and Dawn that we um, compared against were, were, in terms of like the optimizations that they applied, were um, tuned for slightly older GPUs. Uh, but I think that meanwhile probably has changed quite a lot. Um, we also compared against an image processing DSL. And in effect, we match this Halide image processing DSL in performance, despite us being um, accurate on the floating point arithmetic and Halide taking some shortcuts. Um, so let me conclude. So we introduced this modular climate compiler um, where we developed as a kind of technology, technological uh, concept, a stencil dialect and a dialect for GPUs that, that no, many people hopefully can use. Um, we, we integrated the GPU dialect into MLIR, and many of the ideas of the stencil dialect itself um, got contributed to the linear, linear algebra dialect in MLIR, and we've showed very early on that, that we can get quite high performance using MLIR. So that's the end of the talk. As a kind of a very small sneak preview, I want to talk about what, what I personally intend to do next and the kind of the lessons we learned from, from like working on this project. And so one of the lessons that we learned is that, that there are many very successful projects um, that, for example, Cyclone, DeVito, or gg for pi um, that, that attain incredible benefits within the community. So they are, deliver high performance, high productivity, um, allow for portable code, but, but they also have some technical challenges or societal challenges. So the codes are not very composable. Um, these projects um, cannot reuse code from, from like the broader community. And is despite, except of very, some very well-funded projects, it, it's there's kind of a challenge of like how, how long will these projects live? Um, generally, there's kind of um, not enough community interactions as we believe and, and not enough knowledge transfer. And so, so as a solution, um, we kind of came up with a new project um, where we are hopefully going to hear more about soon, um, where we develop what we call cross-domain DSLs. Um, the game changer here is this MLIR project, um, but we want to also make it a lot easier for, for users, for example, GT4Pi, um, which heavily rely on the Python ecosystem um, to build MLIR-based DSLs. In addition, we want to maintain abstractions like the stencil dialect, like the GPU dialect, maybe other dialects that could be beneficial for the broader community. So that's it from my side. Um, so hopefully you'll hear more about this in the future, but for now I close the presentation. And yeah, I thank you everyone for listening. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Grosser, for the really exciting talk. I really enjoyed uh, many, many, many parts. And uh, yeah, maybe it's nice time for some, uh, maybe we have time for one or two questions.